Sure, uh, Wormwood, Nevada is about a small fictional town named Wormwood in central Nevada. And a young couple has just moved to the town and um, the first night of their arrival, a meteorite lands in the center of town and kind of a, a temporary madness ensues in the town's people. And this is their introduction to their new home. And um, the, the couple's name are uh, Tyler and Anna Mayfield and they hail from Nebraska. And Tyler's there to be a teacher and uh, he's got a teaching job and this is his new gig and they're kind of stuck with Wormwood whether they like it or not. Yeah, if I had to categorize uh, Wormwood, Nevada, I think I would call it literary science fiction and just let the critics kind of chew on that. And, and science fiction is always heavy on the plot, but I'm trying to um, balance it more and uh, kind of flesh out the characters. Usually a character, you get to know them and they die three sentences later in a lot of science fiction. One of the main characters, Tyler, loves science fiction and uh, he starts seeing images of a little gray man around town and his wife doesn't believe him. And uh, of course, like no one ever believes the person that sees the little alien man looking at him. And he's also a heavy pot smoker, so you, you don't know yourself if he's like a little off or not. And um, Wormwood itself, uh, when the meteorite lands, um, a lot of people start thinking, you know, maybe the world's about to end and this is a harbinger of it. And uh, Wormwood's a lonely place and you don't have a lot to do. And so kind of a mixture of boredom and loneliness uh, kicks in and people become really fascinated with the meteorite. And my first novel, The Suicide Collectors, was a straight post-apocalyptic story. And, and with Wormwood, I had more uh, post-apocalyptic themes I wanted to bring out, but I wanted to bring, to bring them out and kind of center them in today's world in a small town that, that's very kind of visceral and real on, on one hand and surreal on another. It's when, when I went to Nevada, uh, I only gave myself a few days because I wanted to see how much I could take in in about three days. And I was in my car a lot and it was, it was crazy lonely out there. And uh, when you see signs of the next gas station is 60 miles, you start really, you kind of become aware that you're this unit traveling through a large open space, much like an astronaut would be, feel in a spaceship in, a, in, a, in the, the, the vacuum of space, you know, where there's no help or help may not come until it's too late if something goes wrong. In Nevada, no one can hear you scream. In Nevada, no one can hear you scream, right. By the time I, had, I, I went on my road trip, the first draft was pretty close to done, but um, there were certain things I didn't know about the book until I went to Nevada, such as that it was nestled in a mountain range, that, and all the mountain ranges kind of, most of them run north and south in Nevada. And uh, if you think of the state, it's like a corrugated uh, piece of sheet metal. So mountains are running down it, and then you're a little town nestled in a basin, and it's part of the Great Basin Desert. And uh, I didn't know exactly where that wormwood was nestled in the mountains, and that became a big deal in the next subsequent drafts, because Tyler actually goes into the mountains in the, in the next drafts and stuff. They left the city. They passed beyond the ripening cornfields and lush green plains and entered the desert. Anna moaned in her sleep as Tyler drove, pushing the car past 80 as he absorbed Nevada's landscape. He hadn't seen another car for 30, 40 minutes. Early June, and the countryside was nothing but a pale green sea of sagebrush beneath an unbelievably bright sun. No mule deer, no cottontails, no frolicking antelope. The nature textbooks made it seem like the Great Basin Desert was a wonderland of biological diversity with this hidden natural world beneath it. But that was like saying outer space was packed with matter because it contained microscopic specks of stardust. Right now, as far as Tyler Mayfield could see, he and his wife might have been the last two living creatures on Earth. They crested a hill. Red sunlight flared in the rearview mirror, filling the entire car with light. Half blinded, Tyler adjusted the mirror until it angled down. Dark, almond-shaped eyes stared back at him, cold and unblinking. Tyler swore and slammed on the brakes, twisting the steering wheel hard left. The Volvo spun around three times, almost flipping, before it squealed to a shuddering halt in the middle of the highway. Tyler unbuckled his seatbelt and scrambled around. The back seat was empty. What the hell, Tyler? Anna was awake now, her blue eyes open and darting, her long tan legs jammed into the floor. Even when she was freaked out, Tyler had to admit she still had that beauty queen glow. I thought I saw something. 
Where? In the back seat. I thought something was back there. Anna exhaled. Fuck, Tyler. I'm sorry. Whatever, just keep driving. We can't stop in the middle of the highway. Tyler slapped his cheeks and gripped the steering wheel at 10 and 2 o'clock. He took his foot off the brake and accelerated until they regained speed. He shivered, remembering the dark eyes, and slapped his cheek again. Anna dug into her purse, pulled out a tube of lip gloss, and opened her visors. You're going crazy from all this driving, Ty. You need to chill. Anna folded up the visor. Hey, you see that blob up ahead? Tyler blinked, trying to focus. I think so. Against those mountains? Yeah. I bet it's a town. Sure it is. Civilization. I don't spend a ton of the time in the libraries. I read a few books just to get kind of grounded in whatever topic, like with the first book, The Suicide Plague, and like causes of suicide and like what it does to the survivors of a suicide. And I uh, learned a lot about meteorites from Wormwood and stuff. So I do all this, I do a little bit of research, but I don't ever want to learn too much because all of a sudden your writing gets kind of stiff. If sometimes if you know too much when you go into a piece, you start, you're kind of boxed in and it kind of limits your creativity in a way. When you're kind of a mid-list author, you have to really promote yourself. I have a publicist, that just means they send review copies to a few places and they'll help you set up like a, a bookseller if you want to hold an event. You kind of schedule your own events too now. and. Um, you really have to kind of try to network online and there's a lot of blog campaigns now because you can't drive to all 50 states and there's no book tour money anymore unless you're very high up in the echelon of authors. Uh, so you spend a lot of time at your computer when you could be writing, <laughs> which is the shame of it. Um, I just got done emailing about 700 independent bookstores, booksellers, just to let them know that the books had come out. and. Uh, there's days you question like if it's worth the, the effort, but you just hope the book gets out and put on shelves and uh, people like it. You know? Even if you've written a great book, you still have to really stump for it and become kind of a politician for a couple of months when it comes out. Even if they don't agree with the, the, mo the particular moves you chose to make like at the end of The Suicide Collectors, at least they've read it and carefully considered it. And the worst thing that can happen to a writer, especially with the first couple books, is just to be totally ignored and no one cares. The industry as a whole is kind of like, you're a writer, you should, uh, you should accept your lot in life and be very poor. And you don't get your advance until the book's accepted. And then after your advance is gone, it's usually not very much anymore. Uh, you got to make money somehow, some way. And your royalties don't expect them to come back for uh, 18 months since the book comes out. Um, there's a thing where if you don't sell a ton, even if you make a profit with your books, uh, by the way, this goes out to all the other writers out there who may be watching this. Um, you will not get paid for like 18 months. <laughs> Everyone was singing March of the Cornhusker, but I couldn't take my eyes off the flying cheerleaders. The way the sunlight turned their hair golden as they flew into the air was so beautiful, it freaking broke your heart. Tyler paused and took a drink of beer. I don't know how it happened. Maybe the crowd got too packed or the guy cheerleaders got sloppy. But one of the cheerleaders was thrown off balance, and I was the only one who noticed. I dove forward and caught her before she hit the ground. The cheerleader smiled and kissed my cheek, and right there with the crowd cheering and clapping me on the back, I kissed her on the mouth, hard, and then we brought that goal post to the ground. That was my wife. That was Anna. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, to wrap up, again, I'm David Opegard, and my novel, Wormwood, Nevada, just came out from St. Martin's Press. And I'm also the author of The Suicide Collectors, both of which are available online or at your independent bookstore. Um, my website's www.davidopegard.com. Um, keep writing and stay hungry, people.